shares in Tenaz Energy, a newcomer, are up nearly 90% after the Calgary-based company last week finalized a deal to acquire assets uh, in the Dutch North Sea from a Shell Exxon joint venture. Uh, and this apparently will make Tenaz one of the largest operators in that Dutch marine play by increasing production by the equivalent of 11,000 barrels of oil a day. Um, it, it's all gas here, though, in this case. Um, we're joined by Anthony Marinos, president and CEO of Tenaz Energy. Anthony, great to see you back. Uh, the market likes this deal. Um, so tell us, what are you buying here? Are you actually buying oil rigs here? Uh, will you be operating them, or how does that work? We are buying uh, producing assets, uh, as you said, almost entirely natural gas, platforms, wells, the pipelines that transports uh, that transport the gas to shore, the onshore gas processing facilities. So everything associated with the production phase of the natural gas in the Dutch North Sea. And you'll operate them yourselves with your own people, or do you have contractors do it? We're looking at some of the um, the um, the metrics here. Yeah, uh, we will be operating eighty seven percent of that production. We'll be doing it with our own people. This is the NOM uh, workforce, or uh, NOBV, uh, NOM offshore workforce, that'll be coming over to Tanaz, and that'll be operators uh, in the field. It'll be the uh, office staff as well, the engineers, the geoscientists, uh, the other people who work on the assets, both in the office, in the plant onshore, and mm -hmm. in the offshore uh, platforms. Now, apparently, these are some of these orphan assets, these giant companies just didn't want to be devoting management time to them. So there hasn't been a huge amount of investment over the years. You know, in the last uh, 10 years plus, really, 10 to 15 years, there has been very little uh, investment in the assets. And it's because every company uh, has its set of priorities. And as the assets get to uh, kind of midlife, where these are, uh, it wasn't a priority for, I would say, the shareholders of NOM. 50-50 Shell, Exxon, to uh, do a great deal of investment into those assets. Right. How profitable are they? Uh, well, we think they're uh, quite valuable assets and uh, a high degree of profitability. Uh, we have a lot of the gas uh, price locked in for the next three years, nearly half of the existing production rate already hedged. And we, um, for example, in our press release regarding the transaction, we estimated the 2024 uh, cash flow, free cash flow actually, uh, to be in the order of 90 million euros, somewhere around 135 million uh, Canadian. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I think there's a great deal of profitability. Uh, we make that estimate with the hedges that are in place and the forward gas curve, and uh, that is the number that we uh, currently estimate for this year. So you're, you're paying, sorry, uh, about 246 million Canadian. You may have some additional costs, I know, but um, did you say, Anthony, that you'll get cash flow of how much in a year from these assets? For 24, uh, including the hedges that are in place, and some of these are uh, a bit above the current market, but uh, in any case, with those hedges and the uh, forward price uh, uh, on the strip, we would estimate about 135 million of free cash for the 24 period. Wow, that's, uh, that, that is high enough. Now explain a bit of jargon here for, for me, if you would. Beacon says that you're going to uh, go do several workovers, but, but Beacon is not expecting actual drilling until 2026, 2027. That's their take. But what are workovers? What do they consist of? Well, workovers are when you have an existing well, uh, existing producing well, or it could be an idle well, uh, and uh, you, uh, uh, for example, you might pull the tubing out of the well, go in and perforate a new interval. Uh, you might uh, set various tools in the well uh, to shut off one producing interval, open up a new one. Uh, you might change the size of a tubing string. These would be work on an existing well that does not require new drilling typically doesn't require new facilities either. The platforms are already there, all the producing equipment. So it becomes a very inexpensive way to increase production because you don't have to replicate this massive sunk investment uh, to, to drill and place the platforms and that sort of thing. It's still expensive when it's in the offshore environment. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. But nonetheless, uh, with the production rates you can make, the gas price that is there, you can make a real good rate of return on workovers. And that's going to be 
one element in our program, and it will probably be an earlier element than uh, putting a bit uh, uh, into the ground and, and uh, drilling new wells. And your previous deal, if I remember rightly, you paid one euro to Exxon for something like five, the equivalent of 500 barrels a day. That was a much smaller transaction. Yeah, uh, exactly, Andrew. You're uh, you're very correct about that. And that one uh, was much later in life, I would say, than uh, uh, the assets that we're acquiring now. It was also non-operated. So there are a variety of differences between the uh, uh, production bases that don't make them exactly comparable on a unit of production basis. Uh, hmm. I think this NOBB is a great asset base with really a lot of potential. Uh, putting in additional compressors, uh, uh, working over wells, eventually development drilling, eventually uh, exploration drilling, uh, tying in discoveries that have uh, to date not been produced. All of these things I think are available in the portfolio and they should improve the production profile going forward. And Anthony, can you remind us, what is your plan? Do you, do you think you'll focus on Europe with more acquisitions or will, will you even do more deals in the near future? Uh, you know, we, we would like to do additional deals. We have a what we call a transaction pipeline uh, at, uh, you know, projects uh, for acquiring producing assets or development assets at various uh, stages of uh, deal making, I guess. And we do hope to make additional deals out of that pipeline. We always say that we cannot guarantee the certainty of any deal or the timing of it. And uh, uh, so uh, we don't tend to kind of foreshadow it or, or uh, tell the market if or when something might occur. But yeah, we do intend to make additional deals. Europe is at the top of the list. Uh, second in uh, that, uh, second region for us probably is Latin America today. We've got some optionality to expand in Canada and uh, probably MENA or Middle East, North Africa in some jurisdictions. Uh, you know, might uh, still be acceptable to us, but that's our ranking. Europe, Latin America, around our existing assets in Canada uh, would be probably the main areas. And uh, uh, we'd like to expand in the Netherlands over time. You get a good operating base and you're able to uh, take advantage of the economies of scale and the operation, uh, sometimes by uh, adding additional assets to it. No telling if that will occur, but we believe in the jurisdiction. Uh, we believe in... Uh, the workforce that we're acquiring there uh, to help us grow further down the line, both organically on those assets and potentially through further acquisition.